Hello again, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the circulatory system. And we're going to try to show you some different kinds of circulatory systems in different animals, but we're going to focus mainly on the vertebrate circulatory system. So some animals don't actually have circulatory systems. You remember the sponge. The sponge is a collection of cells, and it's just going to have diffusion of, of, uh, of materials, gases, and nutrients you know, right into the cells of its body. It doesn't have to have arteries, veins, and capillaries. It doesn't have a heart um, to circulate nutrients because it's thin and it's cellular. So um, animals like the flatworms and cnidarians, here we have an example of, of a cnidarian, these creatures are really thin, they're flat and they're thin, and they typically only have, you know, two layers of tissues. They have a, an epidermis and then a, gas, a, gastro, um, a gastrodermis, but they have a gastrovascular cavity, and this gastrovascular cavity typically goes all throughout the body, and when it digests food, it, uh, it, it, the, the food materials just go right into the cells all throughout the body. Also, the epidermis is thin and is all over the outside surface of the body, so oxygen can come right on through, and carbon dioxide or waste gas can go right on out. So there's really no need for a circulatory system in these particular creatures. Now, when you get thicker and you get triple blastic, where you have three cell layers, you're going to have to have um, uh, some kind of circulatory system. So uh, animals that do have circulatory systems are going to be uh, found in one of two categories. Um, and these particular animals are going to have to circulate nutrients and they're going to have to cir circulate or, um, or get rid of gases and wastes. So uh, we're going to, um, to have these circulatory systems that do that because their bodies are so thick. So an open circulatory system is like what you would see in many kinds of things like insects or arthropods. And uh, these particular creatures are going to have a heart. That heart is going to be a pumping structure that will pump um, its blood or hemilymph blood-like material through um, a series of short vessels. And then those fluids are going to circulate through the body. And then once the gases are depleted or the nutrients are depleted, the, the heart will circulate the fluids again to help ensure that circulation or stirring of those materials does occur. Okay, and that's called an open circulatory system because the hemilymph or blood is open to the body cavity. It's not contained just in blood vessels exclusively. Now when you get into more complex animals, we have a closed circulatory system. In this example, you're looking at an earthworm. And uh, it does have pumping vessels, but all of the, so we do have a heart or heart-like structure, but all of the blood or blood-like material is found inside of blood vessels. So it's never in just the body cavity or circulating in the body cavity. And that's called a closed circulatory system. Now we're not going to spend any time talking about open circulatory systems anymore. We're going to talk about closed circulatory systems in these higher uh, creatures. And, uh, you know, you're a mammal, you're a vertebrate, and, and you have a closed circulatory system. So we're going to talk about your system as well. Now, blood is a connective tissue uh, by definition, and uh, it's very, very important. Uh, it transports all kinds of substances in, in creatures that, are, that have a, a closed circulatory system. It's going to transport your food and your oxygen, nutrients, uh, electrolytes, which are dissolved ions, uh, cellular waste products like urea and ammonia, and then all kinds of hormones that the human body or the, the, the animal body creates. Um, it also dis, uh, dis circulates disease-fighting chemicals. Uh, these disease-fighting chemicals are one kind of them is an antibody. An antibody is a protein that your white blood cells make that uh, will stick to and target bacteria, viruses, and various things that come into the uh, into the body. Uh, white blood cells, uh, there's many different kinds of white blood cells. Uh, we have in humans, we have uh, helper T cells and we have cytotoxic T cells and plasma cells. We have neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, all different kinds of white blood cells. Their main job is to fight uh, infections that come in. Uh, another job of the blood is to maintain homeostasis. So we have to maintain an a internal balance. Um, of different kinds of things like our pH. Um, you know, we don't want our body to become too acid or too basic, too acidic or too basic. So one of the jobs of blood is to maintain homeostasis. It maintains homeostasis of also uh, hormones 
and uh, and uh, and waste products and gases, all different kinds of things are maintained in homeostasis. Another main job of the blood is to circulate cell fragments called platelets. Platelets are going to help you to, if you ever get a cut, to stop bleeding. So they'll plug up a, a hole in your in your blood vessel that's been cut, and uh, these are really important. If you have too many platelets circulating in your body, that can be a problem because it can cause blood clots to occur, um, which can block or impede the flow of blood in some part of your body. Uh, another job of blood is to distribute heat through the body. So that's a pretty important job and it helps to maintain that proper pH like we just talked about before. Um, the composition of, uh, of mammalian blood is, uh, is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, most of it's a liquid. 55% of it is what we call plasma. 45% of it is going to be cellular in nature. Um, we do have plasma banks. There are people who donate plasma and get paid for that. Um, and they're not paying you for the water. Most of plasma is water. But a lot of plasma are things like uh, various kinds of ions and molecules that circulate through. Um, these ions and molecules are really important. For example, bicarbonate helps to maintain your pH. Sodium is going to help uh, you know, nerves to work and muscles to work. So is potassium. Calcium makes your bone strong. So does magnesium. It's also important for enzymes to, uh, to function. And uh, chloride helps uh, your uh, nerves to work and it helps uh, blood vessels to work, uh, I mean blood cells to work the way that they need to. Um, a lot of what uh, is in plasma too are, are proteins, uh, blood proteins such as albumin. Albumin helps to maintain osmotic balance or the proper water balance inside of your, um, your blood. Uh, it also helps to, uh, to maintain proper pH. Um, Fibrinogen is going to be a, a factor that helps you to form blood clots so you can stop bleeding. And immunoglobulins, also known as antibodies, are our disease-fighting chemicals that help us to fight viruses and, and various bacteria, maybe even venoms too. Other substances that are transported by blood in the plasma will include uh, nutrients, waste gases, or, or waste products, uh, respiratory gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, and hormones. Okay, now what they're paying people for at the plasma bank is the clotting factors, the fibrinogen and the antibodies. Um, there are also other proteins they can harvest from um, plasma, but they're definitely not paying people for just water. Uh, when you donate plasma, they take out the liquid part of your blood and they put back into you the cellular part of your blood. If you ever go to uh, YouTube and type in uh, how does a plasma bank work, uh, you can watch a video on um, on what that's all about. Maybe one day you'll need a little extra money and maybe you'll go donate some plasma or you just want to to help people out. So the cellular part and what you're seeing in this little picture right here, if we take a blood sample out of your body, put it in a test tube and put it in a centrifuge and spin it, the plasma part is the lightest part and it'll be the part that's up here. That's 55%. The cellular part will be this part down here. Um, in a spun tube of uh, blood. So um, our cellular part is main, made, uh, the cellular part of blood is mainly made of erythrocytes or red blood cells. And in a cubic millimeter, which is a very small quantity, you have about five to six million uh, red blood cells. The main job of red blood cells is to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide, and uh, that's its main job. There is a molecule, a protein inside of it called hemoglobin, that helps to carry um, those gases, but mainly oxygen. Um, another part of the cellular component are the white blood cells, also known as leukocytes. Leuka means white, site means cell. And uh, these are very less numerous than uh, red blood cells, but they have different kinds of jobs. Some of them help to fight parasitic uh, infections, like worm infections, like eosinophils. Basophils are responsible for allergic reaction and for swelling. Uh, neutrophils help to fight bacteria. Lymphocytes are going to have different jobs producing antibodies and fighting against cancer. Uh, monocytes also fight against uh, um, bacterial infections. They also gobble up cellular debris as well. And then we have a lot of, uh, of platelets um, in a cubic millimeter of blood and these help in blood clotting. And this is just what blood, blood looks like under a microscope. Um, so if you took a blood smear and looked at it, uh, you can see red blood cells, you can see platelets, 
Uh, here you can see a, uh, a lymphocyte, and this is a neutrophil, this is a neutrophil, and this is a neutrophil. Um, so white blood cells can be seen too. This is not exactly what, what blood looks like under a microscope. This is what stained blood looks like under the microscope. Uh, these white blood cells would actually be uh, clear under a microscopic slide. Uh, blood cells are made from your bone marrow. Uh, inside of bone marrow, there are um, uh, pluripotent cells, which can become all different kinds of cells. And uh, this is called bone marrow. It's called red bone marrow. And these uh, plur um, pluripotent cells will, uh, will uh, actually form stem cells that can become all different kinds of cells. So, for example, some of the stem cells are myeloid in nature, and they can form red blood cells, platelets, monocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. But some of the uh, stem cells uh, are lymphoid, and they, f they form your B cells and your T cells, which are also known as your lymphocytes. So bone marrow is really important inside of your bones because it forms all the various kinds of cellular components to your blood. And if your bone marrow stops producing blood cells, then you stop making blood cells and uh, you don't live very long when that happens. There are many kinds of cancers that form in the bone marrow um, and can lead to different kinds of, uh, of problems. So we do have three types of blood vessels in these, uh, in these animals that have uh, uh, more complex circulatory systems or closed circulatory systems. And, uh, and uh, one of the types of blood cells are called arteries. Arteries are going to carry blood away from the heart by definition, and they're typically under high blood pressure. So if you ever cut an artery and, uh, and, or cut a blood vessel and it spurts, I mean, like every time your heart beats, it's like spurting, you cut an artery. The smallest of the arter arteries are called arterioles. Capillary, and, and we don't have very many arteries in the human, in, in the in the mammalian or vertebrate body compared to capillaries. Capillaries, the main job they have is to connect arteries with veins. They consist only of a single layer of epithelial cells called endothelial cells, and their main job is for um, nutrient and gas exchange. So thick, chunk, chunky arteries can exchange gases and nutrients because they're too thick. But capillaries being only one cell layer thick, they're only one cell layer thick. So gases like carbon dioxide and oxygen can travel through them very easily. So can nutrients. Veins are your smallest of, uh, uh, excuse me, veins are, um, carry blood um, back to the heart by definition, and they're not under high blood pressure. When you cut a vein, it oozes, it doesn't spurt. Venules are the smallest veins uh, that we have in the, in, the, uh, in the vertebrate body. Excuse me. Yeah, venules are the smallest veins we have in the vertebrate body. This kind of puts it all together a little bit for you to uh, see. So coming out of the heart are arteries. And uh, here's an arteriole, which is the smallest of the blood vessel. These arteries have lots of muscle tissue. They're elastic. And when blood surges through them, they collapse back down. Uh, and this, this smooth muscle tissue helps to force the blood through the body. Typically, it goes away from the heart, so it goes into these capillary beds where you only have one cell layer thick. Here's the endothelial cells you can see. Here's each, each of these is a little endothelial cell, and those are only one cell layer thick. That's where your gas exchange and nutrient exchange occurs. And we have thousands, literally tens of thousands of miles of capillaries. If you put all your capillaries end to end, it would encircle the earth with no problem. Okay, so ton, ton, tons and tons and tons of capillaries. Uh, a venule is the smallest vein, so blood's going to come out of that capillary bed. So blood is going to be forced into the capillary bed and out of the capillary bed. Um, will, it will go into veins. And then veins carry the blood back to the um, heart. Now veins, if you can see right here, veins have these very special structures called valves that ensure a one-way flow. Blood going back this way would push the valve shut. So veins uh, don't have a lot of high blood pressure, but they do have a function of carrying blood back to the heart. To ensure that that happens, we have valves. When those valves break down, sometimes you've seen in the backs of people's legs varicose veins. When you have valves that don't work correctly, it, it pulls blood in veins and gives you that varicose vein that you might see in some people's legs or other parts of their body. Now, 
Um, in the at the level of the capillary, this is where uh, nutrients and gases are going to be exchanged, but this is also where water is exchanged as well. And uh, so, if you see blood coming from a from a arterial into a capillary, um, we have blood pressure that can actually be measured. It's measured in millimeters of mercury. We have a de measuring device that can measure that. And uh, so, if you if you uh, have blood pressure then um, you're going to have a force that can squirt water out of a capillary into the interstitial fluid. So there's a fluid that covers all the cells of the human body. All of your cells are bathed in the fluid. Now, you don't want too much of that fluid because if you had too much, you get edema or swelling. If you have too little, little of it, you shrivel up and your cells dry up. So to maintain the proper levels of fluid, we have a, com a competition between pressures. So coming from the arterioles into the capillary bed, we have a blood pressure that's measured in millimeters of mercury. But also because of the dissolved nutrients or dissolved ions inside of your uh, blood vessels, we have what we call an osmotic pressure. Okay, so uh, you remember back to Biology 101 when you talked about diffusion and you talked about osmosis. Well, osmosis is the movement of water. And uh, the, the way water moves is it moves from an area of low solute to an area of high solute. So wherever you have more solute is where the water is going to move. An example would be if you put salt on a slug. Salt, pure salt, would be a high uh, solute concentration, and it sucks the water out of the slug. And so the slug goes from being the size of a slug to the size of a raisin. Okay. So if you put salt in the slug, all the water will be drawn out of the slug. And that's called osmotic pressure. Well, you know, your tissues have a certain number of dissolved materials in it, and your blood has a certain number of dissolved materials in it, and that creates what we call an osmotic pressure. Well, the osmotic pressure doesn't change. Well, I guess unless you eat a high salt content, then you can increase the osmotic pressure, which could be bad for you. Um, but uh, 22 millimeters of mercury is what the osmotic pressure in this diagram is, uh, is measuring. So if blood pressure is greater than if blood pressure is greater than osmotic pressure, then fluids will move out of the capillary. But if as you get further down away from the arteriole, if the blood pressure diminishes or decreases, osmotic pressure stays the same, then water will flow back in. Okay? So the movements of water through the capillary are going to be maintained by these by the uh, blood pressure and by osmotic pressure. So if you have high blood pressure, um, you know that can actually squirt more water and cause edema to occur. If you have low pressure, low blood pressure, maybe not enough water squirted to the tissues of your body. If you have high osmotic pressure, that could draw water into the capillaries and cause you to have high blood pressure. Okay, so if you eat a high salt content, that can alter the way the water is going to be moving through your tissues. Okay, well, ultimately, you know, hopefully there's some kind of balance that's established and your interstitial fluid stays the right level and the plasma of your blood stays the right level. To ensure that we have a one-way flow of blood through the body, we have veins that are inside of, of um, excuse me, we have valves that are inside of veins. If the valve is open, blood can flow through, but if you push blood back this way, the valve will shut, thus blocking the flow of blood. Now it's important that you exercise because your veins they don't you know move blood by themselves and typically there's very low blood pressure in them but every time your muscle contracts every time you move a muscle you have um, the muscles uh, pushes the blood and if it pushes it this way the valve shuts thus forcing it to go back to the heart so it's really good to exercise if you ever work with people that are in a coma or people in a hospital that uh, that don't have the functioning of their body parts, uh, you know, you have to massage the muscles in order to ensure that blood flow occurs. So that is something that's a, a job that a person that takes care of folks like that have to do. Okay, well, there are different ways that the blood flows through the body. So one of the way the, the, the paths of circulation would be the pulmonary cutaneous or the pulmonary. Pulmonary refers to the lung, cute refers to the skin. Some organisms have lungs and they actually use their skins for, for their skin for circulating um, blood. 
Some creatures just use um, the, the lungs to, to pick up oxygen and drop off carbon dioxide. So this is the path of blood vessels that carries blood from the heart to the tissues or organs that oxygenate the blood. I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. Secondarily, there is another path of circulation called the systemic path of circulation. And this is the path of blood vessels that carries blood away from the heart and to all the body parts and then back to the heart so the heart can uh, can uh, reoxygenate uh, eventually send the blood to be reoxygenated and to get rid of carbon dioxide and these are called the pulmonary and systemic circuits and this is kind of what they look like in different creatures so if you look at a fish a fish only has a two-chambered heart it has uh, has one atrium and one ventricle you can see blood comes to the heart, and when blood goes away from the heart, it goes to the gills to be oxygenated. The gills are the structures that are going to bring in oxygen and remove carbon dioxide. After blood travels from the gills, it then travels to all the systems of the animal's body to deliver the oxygen and the nutrients. And then after it's depleted of the oxygen, it goes back to the heart to be forced back to the gills. Okay, so that's one type of, um, of uh, a circulatory system, and that's a two-chambered heart. In amphibians and in, uh, in some reptiles, we have what we call a three-chambered heart. So we have two atria, two top chambers, and one bottom chamber, one ventricle. So blood going out of the heart has two choices. It can actually go to the lungs and skin. Okay, and uh, pick up respiratory gases or drop off carbon dioxide and come back to the heart. Uh, or coming out of the heart, it can actually go to all the systems of the body. Okay, so, so the, uh, the atrium uh, over here, the right atrium over here, sends blood to the ventricle. The ventricle then can send blood to the uh, lungs or skin, or it can send blood to, blood to the systems of the body. Um, the left atrium. Is going to bring blood back from the uh, from the lung or skin, and it's going to take it to the ventricle, which will then send it to either the lung or skin or to the systems of the body. So it's kind of an interesting arrangement or, or, or organization of how these creatures work. Let me just erase that. Now you, you might think, well, why don't why don't in the amphibians why don't the gases um, why don't the gases uh, get mixed up? Well, there is a little septum here. There is a little septum that uh, that helps to separate blood that's highly oxygenated from blood that's low in oxygen. So the blow, low in blood oxygen goes to get reoxygenated. The blood that's high in oxygen will go to the systems of the body. So there is a, a little septum there that's built in that keeps it organized. And in mammals, which is what you are, you have two atria, two top, cha top chambers, and two, you have two ventricles, two bottom chambers. And, uh, and, and blood comes to the heart and then goes to the lungs. It comes back from the lungs to the heart and then goes to all the parts of the body. And then it comes back to the, um, back to the heart. Okay, So those are, those are uh, three different arrangements. We have a two-chambered heart, three-chambered heart, four-chambered heart. The four-chambered heart is also found in, um, in avian reptiles and in crocodiles, in addition to mammals. So let's talk about the mammalian heart, and that's what we'll talk about for the remainder of this lecture. It's uh, basically a heart with four chambers. So we have four chambers, uh, inner chambers, and they're divided by muscles, a septum. And then there are valves that separate each of the various chambers. The upper chambers are called atria, so there's a right atrium on the right side of your body and there's a left atrium on the left side of your body. And these receive blood from the body and from the lungs. The lower chambers are called ventricles and they receive blood from the upper chambers. The ventricles are separated by a muscular divide called that septum. Alright, now what I'm going to do right now is draw a box diagram heart so you can kind of get an understanding of, uh, of how this is arranged. I think this is the best way to kind of understand how, um, how blood is, uh, is coming in. 
let's see if I can get this eraser right. So I wanted to leave some space. I'll just do it this way. Okay, so coming into the heart, there are two blood vessels that send blood to the heart, and these are called vena cavi. And you have an upper one called the superior, and you have a lower one called the inferior. And uh, it's going to bring blood into the heart. The first chamber of the heart is the right atrium. It's on the right side of your body where your right hand is. And uh, the right atrium will send blood through the uh, an AV valve. Atrioventricular valve. This is a valve right here that allows the blood to only go in a one-way path. Blood is going to come to the right ventricle. It's then going to flow out and go to the lungs by this blood vessel that's called the pulmonary trunk. Now, blood will come back from the lungs, oxygenated. It goes to the lungs, low in oxygen. It comes back through, through, uh, from the lungs through these blood vessels called pulmonary veins. And these are going to bring blood back to the left atrium. There's another set of atrioventricular valves right here. And it's going to go to the left ventricle. Blood will then go through the aorta, and there's a set of valves here called the aortic valves, and that goes to the body, that carries blood to the body. There also is a set of valves right here called pulmonary valves, and these valves help to establish a one-way flow of blood through the body. So um, that's kind of how blood circulates through the heart, and you might want to pause and go back and review that. Uh, I want to show you what it looks like in a real heart. Um, that's the box diagram. The real heart's a little bit more complicated, and uh, that's why I started with the box diagram uh, first. But uh, you have all the same parts, so you can see the vena cava here and the vena cava here. These are carrying blood to the right atrium. So we have the right atrium, which is this structure right here. The right atrium, when the heart contracts, is going to push blood through the AV valves to the right ventricle, which is the structure here. Right ventricle is going to, when it contracts, send blood through the pulmonary trunk. And these pulmonary arteries are going to carry blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. So coming back from the lungs, we have blood coming through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. Blood then goes to the left ventricle, and then it squirts blood. When the left ventricle contracts, it squirts blood through the aorta, and this blood is carried to all the systems of the body. Now if you notice, the left side of the heart is thicker than the right side of the heart because the right side of the heart only has to send blood to the lungs, but the left side of the heart has to carry blood to all the organs of the body, so the muscle tissue has to be really thick and really strong in order to send blood to all the parts of the body. And so in this diagram, you can see um, the blood coming from the lower body and from the upper body to the right atrium that goes to the right ventricle, and then is pushed to the lungs. And we call that the pulmonary circuit because it's carrying blood to the lungs. Bringing blood back to the heart and then to the left atrium and left ventricle and then to all the parts of the body, that would be called the systemic circuit because it's carrying blood from the heart to the systems of the body and then back to the heart. So we can see here the pulmonary system carrying blood to the lungs and the systemic circuit carrying blood uh, from the lungs, from the heart, to all the uh, parts of the body, to all the systems of the body. And this is showing you kind of the arrangement of how things go. So if blood comes to the right atrium, it moves to the right ventricle, then the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries to the lungs, comes back from the pulmonary veins to the left atrium, goes to the left ventricle, then it goes to the aorta, to all the arteries of the body, to all the systems of the body, to all the capillaries, and then it comes back via veins through the vena cava and back to the right atrium. 
Um, something that's interesting about the heart is sometimes these blood vessels that feed the heart. So there are blood vessels that literally feed the heart. These are called coronary arteries. So you can see them coming off the left and right side of the aorta. So the heart has to be fed blood just like every other part of the body. It has capillary beds, it has arteries, veins, and capillaries. Um, if you block any of these coronary arteries, that will cause uh, coronary artery disease. And if it's totally blocked, it'll cause a heart attack to occur. And, you know, we can go in and we can put stents in. So we can thread into, into these blood vessels, these things called stents, which are these little, almost like cages of metal that will open up and reestablish the flow of blood. Um, that's very common. Maybe you have know somebody that's had a stent. If it's really super blocked, we will actually cut a vein out of your body and we will bypass the blocked area with um, putting in, cutting in, and splicing in a vein from some other part of your body to reestablish the flow of blood. And that's called a bypass. You know, we think that uh, some of the things that cause... Um, um, coronary artery disease would be things like smoking and poor diet. And uh, so, you know, if you do smoke, uh, I hope that you would stop and think about uh, your arteries. If you, uh, if you have a poor diet, uh, maybe that's something you can change so you can stop the, the blockage. There are people that are genetically predetermined to have blocked arteries because they produce a lot of cholesterol naturally. All right, so let's talk about a little bit how the heart functions here for just a second. So the cardiac cycle is when the atria and ventricles contract and relax. So that's called a cardiac cycle. Um, when you have the atria or ventricles contracting, that's called systole. Atrial systole is when the atria contract and ventricular systole is when the ventricles contract. Asystole is when there's no contraction and you're dead. Diastole is when the atria or ventricles relax. So we have atrial diastole is when the atria relax, and ventricular diastole is when the ventricles relax. And when you hear the lub-dub sound, this corresponds, so when you hear the, the heart sound that you're familiar with heart sounds, so the first heart sound is when the AV valves shut, and the second sound is when your pulmonary and aortic valves actually shut. I think I'll go back and show you a picture of what that uh, represents. Let me get my eraser here and uh, erase this a little bit so we can kind of look at that. Just kind of erase a little bit of this. So a cardiac cycle occurs when you have a contraction of the atria. Now the atria contract together. They don't track, uh, contract separately. So both atria will contract at the same time. And, uh, and then both ventricles will contract at the same time. Probably you can see that if a ventricle contracts, it slams shut those uh, atrioventricular valves so that blood doesn't go back into the, into the atria. Uh, when, those valves, when those valves right there slam shut, that creates that first heart sound. So if you just listen to your heart or listen to a person, you know, put your head on someone's chest and listen to it, you can hear that first heart sound when those valves close. After the, after the ventricles contract, though, they relax, and blood, by its very nature, wants to go back into the heart because of gravity. And it slams shut these, these valves here and here. These are the, the aortic and the pulmonary valves. So that's your second heart sound when those things slam shut. Now remember, valves establish a one-way flow through the heart. That's the job of the, of the valve. Um, there is a, a cardiac conducting system. And uh, we actually have a pacemaker that determines the rate at which the heart contracts. And that's called the SA node. And that's called your pacemaker. It's located in the right atrium. And uh, I believe, I didn't, leave a, I didn't leave enough room. But uh, let me go ahead and show you with a little drawing of that where those things are located real quickly. So your SA node is located over here in the right atrium. So if you look at a little box diagram, Here's the right atrium over here. That's where the SA node is, uh, is located. Uh, we then have an AV node, which is located down here in this little part of the, uh, in between the right atrium and right ventricle. Um, there is a bundle of His that's located in the septum of the heart. And, uh, and then we have Purkinje fibers that are going to come out to either side. 
Okay, so that's kind of like visually what it looks like. And when the pacemaker sends signals, it sends it across the top of the heart and it sends it eventually to the AV node. The AV node sends its signals, these conducting fibers send its signals down the septum of the heart through the, um, the bundle of his, which then go to the Purkinje fibers. So we get the top of the heart contracting first, the AV valve slows down the signal, and then we get the bottom of the heart that contracts. Okay, and this allows for the, the correct uh, movement of blood through the heart. If you get a wrong signaling, it will cause various kinds of uh, things to happen where your blood won't circulate through your heart correctly. Um, if you don't have a pacemaker, you're dead, so they have to go in and put one in. So if you have pacemaker surgery, that's just when they go in and put a pacemaker into your chest cavity, and uh, it will, it will uh, um, simulate the activity of the pacemaker. The AV node is a group of slow fibers in the septum, separating the right atrium and right ventricle, and it transmits the signal from the SA node to the bundle of his, like I just showed you. The AV bundle is found in the septum of the heart, and uh, separating the right and left sides of the heart. And these are fast fibers, and they transmit to the Purkinje fibers, which will finish up and signal to the ventricle muscle tissue. And this is kind of show you, shows you a little bit of how um, that works. Uh, if you've ever seen an ECG before, um, that is going to be uh, an electrocardiogram. And it's, a, it's basically a graphical display of your heart rhythm. Um, so if we notice up here, if the SA node uh, if it, uh, is sending a signal out, we see, see that that can actually be seen on the ECG. When you have uh, the, all of the atria uh, contracting, you can see that on the ECG. When the ventricles eventually get their electrical stimulation, so we have the bundle of his and then the Purkinje fibers, when it begins to be stimulated, we can see this particular wave. So when it's totally contracting, we can see this particular wave on an ECG. So the ECG represents uh, waves of electrical activity and uh, and uh, so either relaxation or or uh, contraction of the heart muscle tissue. Of course, when you see an ECG that looks like this, there is no electrical activity. Uh, if you see an ECG that looks like this, that means there's something wrong with the uh, with the atria. If you saw an ECG that looked like this, that means there's something wrong with the ventricles. They're not contracting. Okay, so you can become competent at that and. If you become a paramedic or uh, a cardiac tech or, or a paramedic or, um, or any of those, the doctor, nurse, you'll learn to read ECGs. There are certain things that will stimulate the, um, um, the heart to increase in its rate or decrease in its rate. Epinephrine or adrenaline is a hormone we naturally secrete when we're scared that will help to increase the rate of uh, the heart. The medulla, which is a part of the brain, our brain stem, uh, the medulla can increase or decrease the heart rate, so it basically is the respiratory center, and uh, not the respiratory center, but the, the cardiac center, and it regulates an increase or decrease in heart rate. And this is just showing you an, an ECG, and uh, so atria contracting, ventricles contracting, ventricles relaxing, so you can see that on uh, electrocardiograph. So blood pressure is associated with, uh, with arteries. Arteries are going to be, um, uh, you know, that's where blood is going to be forced out of the heart and sent to all the parts of the body. And it's felt as a pulse point at certain parts in your body. I'm sure you felt your carotid artery or you felt your, let's see if I can put this in. So the inner wrist, I can't really show that too well in this camera. The inner wrist, there is a radial artery that you can feel as pulse points. So uh, if you've ever seen a blood pressure, like 120 over 80 is kind of like an average blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure is the maximum pressure that occurs at the height of ventricular contraction, and that's your top number. Diastolic pressure is the lowest pressure that occurs um, in the ventricles, and that's when they're in relaxation, and that represents your bottom pressure. So if you have really super high blood pressure, 
that can be really, really dangerous, but super low blood pressure can be dangerous too because you'll pass out. Super high blood pressure causes your arteries to open up and leak blood inside your body, and that's really not good for your, for your body. So taking a blood pressure, if you got interested in that, you're welcome to look at this video right here online, and it will teach you how a blood pressure is taken, but essentially we use a sphygmomanometer, which is a, a blood pressure uh, cuff and a, a reading device. We also use a stethoscope, which is the uh, thing that you use to actually hear um, the heart, um, the pressure of blood being squirted through your arteries. You know, we do put a blood pressure cuff on, what that does is block the flow of, if you push this little bulb right here, uh, it inflates an air bladder that's inside the blood pressure cuff. That air bladder will tighten down until no blood circulates through the artery. When you release the flow, when you release the air from the air bladder by, by turning this little valve right here, um, you can actually read the pressure. When you hear blood starting to flow through that, that's the top number. And when you stop hearing blood flow through, that's going to be your bottom number. So you have to listen with the stethoscope in order to be able to hear the blood flowing through. This is a pretty challenging skill to learn. If you ever become a nurse or a doctor or a physician's assistant, this would be something that you'd have to learn how to do. And again, you can watch that video if you'd like to see how that's done. And the last thing I want to say about the circulatory system is that... Um, the, the reason that we don't have blood pressures taken in veins, and let me go back, the reason we don't have blood pressure taken in veins is because um, if, you, if you look, the highest pressures are felt inside of the aorta and arteries and arterioles. As you get away from the heart, blood pressure diminishes significantly. As we go into these capillary beds, these capillaries have huge amounts of area. So as blood is forced through something small into something big, pressure diminishes significantly. So we have very little, um, we have very little area of arteries and arterioles, but we have a huge amount of area of capillaries. And you can see a diminishment of the blood's velocity or flow and a diminishment of, of, of its pressure when it goes into these capillary beds. Now remember, you have tens of thousands of miles of capillaries that blood is being forced into. Okay, and when it hits this cap these capillary beds, pressure and velocity diminish significantly. Okay, well that ends our little uh, lecture on the uh, circulatory system. Um, that's all you have to know, and uh, it's much more complex than that, but if you take anatomy and physiology, then you can get a better sense of more of its complexity. Okay, until next time, remember you can email me if you have questions, comments. Uh, please feel free to, to email each other. Make sure you keep up with your due dates and uh, with all your work. I'll see you next time.